been meaning to harvest Mioga ginger every day for a while and now a lot of them are past harvestability because the flowers are peeking through. But there are some that haven't yet reached that stage. So these are the stalks, the ginger stalks, but they send up these beautiful flowers and that's what I've pickled before. They're pretty amazing. Um, so I'm gonna grab any that I still can while I can. Uh, one. I'm just cutting it kind of low down there in the soil. It's actually really great to have some planted in a more cool shady spot because you can miss your moment and not miss your moment if you have some that are in the sunny area that are already way past but these because they're more cool I think they're they're more to get like this one's too small I'm not gonna take this little baby but, but here's a big pocket of them whoa look mm -hmm. see that I've had this in the fridge for the last few days because I just haven't had time to get to it I didn't wash it before I put it in the fridge because Food seems to stay better if it's not washed, if it's in the fridge. Um, but now I'm going to wash it before I get to the pickling. Mioga ginger is a really beautiful perennial ginger that we did not think was hardy to zone 5B, which is where we live, but it's turned out to be so. It doesn't make that root like ginger that you get in the store, but it makes this amazing bulb that has an incredible ginger flavor and when pickled lasts a really long time and just like adds a lot of goodness to food, other foods. Uh, they're astoundingly beautiful and Sean and I just, I, I was washing them and Sean left the room and I was thinking, wow, they really do look like little hands. I wonder if they're good for the hands, like for joint pain. And then Sean walked in the room and said, wow, they're so beautiful. I, they look just like hands. I wonder if they're good for arthritis. So <laughs> we, we don't know, but it's neat. It's a good thought and we both had it separately. <laughs> I'm following the directions in this book. And it's got a Mioga recipe. I'm going to put all the Mioga just in some vessel that can accommodate a weight and salt them and add a little water and let it sit overnight and then come back. So. In that book, it says for 10 Mioga, they're using like a teaspoon of salt. So they're just like loosely salting it. So I've got more than they've got. And I'm just like massaging it. In. So you're not squeezing hard, just, no, just stirring kind yeah. of? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then adding some water. And then I'm just going to weight it down. And let it sit for the night. And you use one beet's worth of weight in those one bowls? One beet and three bowls worth of weight on a plate is really, that's the, you can try half a beet or two beets, but I would say <laughs> one big, two small beets, one big beet. <laughs> Uh, our mioga have pressed overnight with our beaten bowl and plate scene, and now it's the next morning. I'm gonna move it on. So, I did end up adding a tiny bit more water than maybe was shown in the video, just to make sure that the plate and the weight submerged the mioga in the salty water, and now. This is where they are in their life. And I'm going to blanch them. So they have even softened just from sitting overnight in that salt water, but I'm going to take them out of the water, blanch them, and then just cover them with umeboshi plum vinegar, and that's, that's the whole process. So I have a pot of water that's coming to a boil, and I'm just going to 
toss in those Mioga and let them be in there for a couple of minutes until the color starts to kind of get more bright. I don't want to cook them to the core. I just want to take the kind of edge off of their crispness to probably help the umeboshi vinegar penetrate. If they were just completely raw, it wouldn't do that as much. So then I'll put them in cold water to stop the process of the cooking. So it's boiling. Okay. Um, I'm gonna oh. So can you see the color is like kind of has gotten a bit more bright. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually going to take them out, so, because, you know, they keep kind of cooking as you take them out until they get into the cold water. And, um, I think... You could have your cold water at the ready, but I kind of want them to slow, like, because I took them out slightly prematurely, probably, because I'm always concerned to overcook them. I'd rather have them cool down slowly, then overcook them, and then have it be kind of, so they're, yeah, you can feel they're just, like, barely softened. So now... I'm just going to kind of squeeze out the excess water from the blanching and put them into this jar. So I'm just going to cover with this. You could use a different kind of vinegar, it just would have a different flavor. This is incredibly salty, but really good flavor and the leftover liquid becomes this like gingery, salty stuff that you can put in soups or, you know, saute something with. Uh, sit and with some time they really absorb into their core that umeboshi vinegar and this is one from a two years ago two years not ago, last maybe. year maybe the year before because they're yeah so they're like this and i i think we've shown this but you know it's really softened and fully absorbed mm. that and you can like chop it really fine and put it into food and on rice it's, it's a true dream <laughs> Since there's vinegar, I, I need to put wax paper or something in between these, but I haven't, I don't find anything. I haven't found anything at the moment, so I will be doing that because otherwise it'll get corroded and yucky and hard to open. But for now, that is what it is. Hopefully I'll remember to come back to it. Although I guess I never did it on this one and it's fine, so. Yeah. I may or may not do that, but you may want to.